We're told we need to go full renewable to save the planet. You've got solar, you've got wind power, you've got hydroelectric power. Seems like a no-brainer, right? You just replace all the fossil fuel and nuke plants with green energy, and Bob's your uncle, right? Well, no, actually, not even close. The fact is, we cannot go full green energy right now. Well, why not? Hi and welcome back to Scotty's Tech.info. I'm Scotty with my co-host Cletus the Tribble. This is part two in my Green Grid series. If you haven't seen part one, entitled Green Grid Part One, Spain's Epic Blackout, you might want to watch that video first. Uh, or if you don't see the link above my head, you can click more and in the video description, there's a link to that video. So what are the problems with a fully green grid? Well, the number one biggest problem is a rather severe lack of inertia. Now, you've probably heard this term inertia mentioned in online news articles and such, and you're probably wondering what the heck it means. And the problem is no one is really explaining it very well. So, as I mentioned in part one of this series, the power grid consists traditionally of a bunch of power plants. Each power plant has a series of generators, and all those generators must produce power at the same frequency, the same phase, and the same voltage. They all spin at whatever, like 3000 RPM for 50 Hertz. They all have to spin exactly in sync. If the frequency goes up or down because one or more generators is not spinning in sync, you have problems and the grid collapses. So they're all sort of dancing together perfectly. So where does inertia come into play? Well, um, a good analogy to understand inertia is a tabletop fan. You take the fan, you plug it into the wall, and of course it spins and blows air. If you yank the power cord out of the power socket, what happens? Well, the fan will continue to spin for a certain amount of time until the friction in the bearings of the motor and the resistance of the fan blade spinning against the air slow it down to a complete stop. As it happens, traditional spinning power generators uh, take advantage of this inertia. Now, when I say generator, I'm not talking about this kind of generator. That's a little gasoline engine that powers a really teeny tiny generator. I'm talking about a generator that looks more like this. They're really, really big. And because they're all spinning very, very fast, and they're really, really big and massive, they're very heavy, they have a lot of what we call rotational inertia. You've got all these generators in the grid and they're all spinning perfectly in sync. And then suddenly, maybe they're supplying a certain amount of power and maybe you plug in your giant particle accelerator that you've got stashed in your basement. That starts sucking a whole lot of power from the grid. What happens is, each generator is sitting there spinning. We'll use this fan as an example. Say that's a generator. Each generator is spinning and it's producing X amount of power. Suddenly the demand on the grid goes up. What happens? Well, because these generators are so big and so massive, they tend to resist any change in the speed. And if suddenly you start pulling more, you try to start pulling more power from the grid, that power has to come from somewhere. A coal-fired power plant, any kind of power plant, can't react instantly by stuffing more fuel in. So what happens is each generator actually converts some of its spinning energy into added electricity. Now this only happens for a few seconds, but it's just long enough so that it's spinning, demand goes up, it starts spinning slower, the generator here, the power going in is the same as before, but the generator is actually converting some of that spinning energy into added electricity coming out the power cord, which temporarily, for a few seconds, like between two and seven seconds, provides the extra energy needed. That two to seven seconds is just long enough to allow the control systems of the power plant to go, oh geez, our generator that's normally spinning like this, it's going like this now, it's slowed down. That means the frequency is gonna drop. That's bad, as I mentioned, that can collapse the grid, right? So then the control systems of the power plant feed in more water, steam, coal, nuclear, whatever, to get the generator to spin up to speed. This rotational inertia is kind of an integral part of how AC generators work. It's just a function of the fact that they're big, massive, really heavy, rotating things. 
And so historically, this is what has provided a lot of the stability to the grid because all that rotational inertia acts as like a, a two to seven second buffer that allows the power plant time to compensate, stuff more fuel in, and get to the new higher level of power required that all the users on the grid are demanding. Okay, so that's a traditional power grid, but why is inertia a problem with green energy? Well, green energy power generation in and of itself has zero inertia. Now you're probably going, well, hang on a minute, Scotty, what about wind turbines? I mean, windmills, they've got, you know, usually three blades and they're spinning and it's turning a generator, right? Yes, but many windmills don't even generate AC, alternating current, directly. They generate DC, and then that power is fed through an inverter. In any case, um, there's very little you can do extra. Like, you can't make the wind blow more. So even wind power has almost zero inertia. Okay, well, what about solar panels? Solar panels are actually the worst because they don't have spinning anything, and you have the sun shining, it hits the panels, the panels generate DC, and that DC is collected by a thing called an inverter, which inverts the DC into AC. By default, with wind and solar, there's no actual energy storage, which means there's no inertia, which means they have zero capacity to compensate for these fluctuations in the power grid. Uh, in fact, hydropower is the only one that does, and hydro is actually pretty cool because it can ramp the power up and down um, in a matter of seconds in many cases. This is pretty handy, but not everyone has a giant dam where they can build a hydroelectric plant. And of course, the hydro plant must not be running at 100% of capacity because then it has no overhead. Okay, well, what about nuclear plants? Because they're sort of considered kind of green, but not really. They produce radioactive waste, but many countries are keeping them around. Obviously, nuclear power plants, they use a fission reaction to produce heat, which heats water, turns it into steam. Steam turns the turbine. Turbine turns the generator. Boom, you've got electricity. So nuclear plants still have actual big honking spinning generators. So they have inertia, right? Well, many people say, no, they don't, because all nuclear power plants run at 100% capacity. That's actually not true. Um, in France, for example, where I live, they have 56 nuclear reactors, and there are different types of nuclear reactors that are run in different ways. So many of the, uh, I think they're pressurized water reactors, I don't remember exactly, but many of the nuclear reactors in France are capable of running between 30 and 100% of maximum power. This means that nuclear plants actually can provide inertia to the system depending on what type of nuclear plant it is. In fact, after the recent power outage in Spain, Denmark happened to come out and they said, yeah, we've been thinking for like 40 years that maybe we want to go nuclear. And after the power outage in Spain, we've got a lot of green energy ourselves, too much perhaps. So we're going to fire up some nuke plants now. Hmm. So like fossil fuel power generating plants, nuclear plants do have inertia and they can also be used to help stabilize the grid when there are fluctuations or changes in demand for power on the grid. But okay, besides this big one, inertia, what are some of the other problems with going towards a 100% fully green grid? Well, first we have to understand that there are different types of power plants. There are more or less three different main types. The first is what they call a baseload power plant. Now, you've got a power plant, it's providing electricity. At some point during the day, the amount of power required will be at a minimum. X number of megawatts or gigawatts or whatever. A baseload plant runs at maximum capacity, so it's as efficient as possible, and it provides that minimum level of power 24 hours a day. You have a second type of power plant that throttles up or down during the course of the day to provide extra power because, say, during the summer it's hot, um, you might need extra air conditioning running in the middle of the afternoon. So they know that in the afternoon the power demand is going to go like this. It's going to peak. These second type of power plants, they fire them up or down to smooth out the power demand over the course of the day. And then there's a third type of plant that's used sort of only in emergencies. These are typically fossil fuel fired plants, usually gas turbine generators, because they can be fired up very, very quickly uh, in the event of an emergency. Solar and wind power are simply less reliable and less constant sources of power 
than traditional power generation. And on top of that, on their own, they have no inertia. So another problem with going fully green right now is that we need to upgrade our power grids in pretty much all countries. Why? Well, um, yeah. If you're generating a whole lot of, say, wind and solar power in one location, generally the wind blows and the sun shines better in one part of the world or the country than another. So if you're generating most of your power over here, you need to create high voltage lines, new high voltage lines, to transfer all that power to, say, the big city where it's needed. We also need to beef up our power grids, uh, many studies have suggested, by a factor of two to five times, because if we switch over to all electric everything, our power grids simply don't have the capacity to handle all of it. Think about maybe um, you have a natural gas or a fuel oil boiler and central heating, and you're going to replace it with a high efficiency inverter heat pump. Well, that's great. But uh, first of all, you've got the often ridiculous cost of the heat pump. And second of all, you're suddenly consuming a whole lot more electricity, which means the grid needs to be beefed up, never mind the added cost to you. And then, of course, you're consuming more electricity, so you go, ooh, I should get some solar panels installed, which you have to usually pay for. And if you don't, the government subsidizes it, and guess what? Your taxes go up. So, right, the grid needs to be beefed up, and there's also a whole lot of money involved. So just the costs and the infrastructure upgrades required to go fully green are literally insane. The fact is that the power grids in most of our countries are well over 100 years old in many cases, and they're designed for centralized distribution. It's kind of like an apple tree. Instead of the tree producing apples on ever thinner branches coming from a central trunk, suddenly we want the apples to produce the tree. Well, no problem, right? Yeah, actually it is a problem, because you have to kind of redesign your grid in many cases, and the way you're transferring power is completely different. And keep in mind that you're talking about switching from a relatively small number of big heavy rotating generators with inertia to possibly millions of individual inverters all trying to sync to the same power grid and dance nicely together. And in many cases they do sync up and everything works perfectly fine, but without any inertia, unless we add more actual energy storage to the grid. This is what is severely lacking in many countries. You got the solar panels, you got the windmills, you got all this green energy coming in, but in most countries the deployment of actual energy storage has not kept pace with the deployment of the panels and the wind turbines themselves. What do we mean by energy storage? Well, it can be as simple as a battery bank. The solar panels charge the battery bank, uh, then when the battery bank is full, the inverter sends the power out onto the grid. When the sun goes down, the battery bank pro provides power to, say, your house. Or in the event of an emergency, each battery bank could act as a lot of inertia to help rebalance the grid. That's lacking in many cases in many countries. There are other types of energy storage besides just battery banks. Uh, they've come up with all sorts of schemes. They have, like, giant cylindrical flywheels attached to a motor generator where you feed power in to spin the thing up really fast and when you want to suck power out you switch the motor generator into generator mode and you convert that rotational energy back into electricity. These solutions obviously aren't 100% efficient but nothing ever is. Um, also there is uh, even compressed air where they dig a giant underground cavern in some rock and they pump compressed air in and then during, say, at nighttime when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing, whatever, uh, you take that compressed air out and use it to spin generators, and there you go, you have energy storage. There are many different types of energy storage solutions, and many of them have been implemented. But in most cases, um, they're implemented in such a way that they can provide enough power for maybe eight normal-sized homes for, say, four to six hours that obviously wouldn't have done anyone in Spain any good. So the amount of energy storage for green energy that has been deployed is, like, woefully inadequate. If you had that energy storage, then you would have a replacement for the inertia on the grid that you lose when you get rid of the spinning generators. The fact is the power grid is a delicately balanced system. It has been for over a hundred years, and because of this spinning Jenny inertia, it's been great. Now that we're switching to green energy, we're running into problems because we need something to replace that inertia. Anything that disrupts the balance 
of the power grid can cause a catastrophic collapse. And the thing is, any power engineer out there who hasn't chugged the green Kool-Aid will tell you exactly what I'm telling you right now. In fact, you can hop on Google and you can do a search and people have been talking about this for well over 20 years. It's like, it's well known, it's, it's nothing new. It's nothing surprising. So, well, why the heck isn't anyone listening? It seems that in many countries, that push to go fully green is sort of drowning out the voices who are saying, hang on a minute, we need to be careful about we, how we do this, we need to think about it carefully, we need to make sure we have that extra energy storage to compensate, to replace the inertia, you know, we need to do it well. Except they're not doing it well because, right. As for what happened in Spain, um, we may or may not find out soon enough, but it's certainly true that the way they have deployed green energy uh, led to instability of the grid. In fact, uh, just yesterday there was an interesting article, it was, um, they talked about it in the Spanish press and also the UK Telegraph reported, that apparently Red Eléctrica, the publicly owned electric company that covers all of Spain, warned the government that they were pushing too hard on green energy and that they would have blackouts and power outages, right? And the governor, the government, the prime minister responded and said, nah, everything's fine. They basically ignored the warnings from their own electric company. And then of course you had this big outage and in the aftermath, the prime minister is insisting that, no, 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 green energy is wonderful. It's fantastic. Just keep going more and more. So yeah, that may be why we're going to have to wait five months to find out what the cause was. Um, maybe there was something a little weird that went on, I don't know, but certainly they got too much green energy and not enough storage, and I would bet a large sum of money on that causing uh, most of the problems that happened during the blackout. And you know, in the end, despite all of this, green energy itself is not a bad idea. It's a great idea. It's nifty. I mean, you convert the sunlight and the wind. Sure, there are problems with it, but the idea itself is good. The problem is how it's actually being implemented by governments around the world. And, you know, when you don't even listen to your own power company, you've got a problem there. And it's not the green energy. So the question is, is anyone actually doing green energy right? It turns out the answer to that is yes, there is one country, and you'll never guess who it is, there is one country who does, in my opinion, seem to be doing it right. That is the topic of the next video. Let me know what you think in the comments below. For more Techie Tips, see scottystech.info. Thanks for watching. See you next time.